Hey everybody and welcome to Bible study that doesn't suck. This is Pastor Megan at Grace Lutheran physically in Grace Lutheran for two more days um, before I leave the country again. And our website is www.gracesf.com and we have worship live in person and online every Sunday at 1030 a.m. And I just got off of a 17 hour flight uh, about three hours ago so I might be a little loopy but what's new? Hello, I'm Pastor Amanda Zensalo. I serve at Central Lutheran Church in Northeast Portland, Oregon. Our services are available here in the building or online at 1015 a.m. on Sunday mornings. You can check us out at centralportland.org. And I just made Pastor Megan sit and wait for me for way too long getting ready for a Bible study that doesn't suck. So the punch drunkiness that they show is... Um, my fault. I'm so very sorry. And I, I owe Megan a, a soy hot chocolate yumminess soon because of um, right. my, my time. So thank you, Pastor Megan. Some people. Some people. Some pig. Some pig. Yeah, it's a good book. Charlotte's Web, everybody. Back. Just in case you didn't remember. Yeah. Um, I think a good place to start for our Bible study is behind Pastor Amanda's head. Pastor Amanda, will you talk a second so people can see the sign behind your head? There's a sign behind my head. I don't know which one is behind my head. It says, prepare, repent. <laughs> and, then, and then it says sin, and it's got words like depression and fear on there. And it You're just sick. cracks me up because anybody who's never been to Bible study that doesn't suck before, you might think that Pastor Amanda is a very... Uh, angry pastor <laughs> and that's completely the opposite of her theology but the theme of this week's scripture text is that there are people who have ideas about rules that you're supposed to follow or traditions that they think are the ultimate tradition and the the truth of of christian tradition is that we have a history of diversity but sometimes we have people who are in the majority a mostly white male majority who like to narrow our attention on what they think tradi true tradition really is. And so if you've ever heard a list of rules of you need to believe this or you ain't a Christian, well then this is the Sunday for Bible study that doesn't suck for you because this is the Sunday of um, each reading reminding us that diversity is good and reminding us that the the faithful community has always disagreed. They've always reinterpreted scripture based on their social location. So based on the time and the place where they lived and they have always erred on the side of God loving us rather than God being mad. Um, that whole, all those bits about God being mad were ancient ways of telling us that God loved us because the us that was getting in trouble was never us. It was those people we're so mad at, and that means God's on our side because God's mad at them too. Um, and so we let's um, maybe start with the Nehemiah text, and I'll talk a little bit because I know Pastor Amanda loves Corinthians, and I think it's boring. <laughs> uh, the Nehemiah text is uh, a text that is written post-Babylonian captivity. It's written in a way that sounds like it's a historical reference to a particular church and things that they are talking about and because it because the struggles that this this church is going through sound oh so familiar we think it's talking about a particular time and space but um nehemiah is writing about uh symbols and he's kind of talking about metaphors rather than a particular historical community. So that's an important thing to, to know just off the bat. Uh, but the reason that it sounds like it's probably a real place is because it's a time where they are leaving a very strong culture, the Babylonian culture. And despite all of the turmoil that they have been through and the fact that they are now liberated from their oppressors, they're not spending their time going, oh, oppression was horrible. Let's make sure we never oppress anyone ever again. Their response is to fight amongst themselves about how they should live and about what 
things they should teach and what kind of foods they should eat and who's in the club and who's not in the club and you're sitting in my pew and I'm mad about it and uh, the budget on that line item is not supposed to be that way because once in 1964 there were bugs and plants. Oh, I don't think it said that. Wait a minute. And so I, that's just my way of saying that it's very easy for pastors and for congregations to project the internal adiaphora, which is a very fancy word that Martin Luther used for when we spend too much time and energy and passion arguing about things that really aren't that important. Um, so it's, it's, it's arguing about who's going to take the trash out instead of who's going to make dinner. Uh, it's arguing about the one light that doesn't work in the room you never use rather than um, turning off the light in the room you do use, right? So it's it's anytime we're distracted by details that aren't really super important, it kind of triggers us. And it's something that we've, maybe the only tradition we've had as Christians is fighting amongst ourselves about what things mean and who can come and where they should get to sit and uh, how fancy they should be. And so this is, a, I think, a pretty interesting passage. Um, and I believe it is repeated three times, at least that's what I'm told in Feasting on the Word, which is very helpful. Um, it's There is a phrase in Ezra that is repeated three times in the, the verses that, that we're reading for this week. And it's all the people. Who's God for? All the people. Who am I talking about? All the people. They're arguing about, oh, you... The forks are missing. We're so mad. There's no forks in the kitchen. All the people get to be here and we don't care about the forks. The whole point that you're supposed to take away from this is that all the people are God's people. Um, and I love the way that the text ends um, by taking some of the things that if you have ever read The Seven Deadly Sins, there is a, a movie about it, a couple movies about it. Um, if you have heard of the seven deadly sins, there's this idea that there are some sins that are worse than others and we need to make sure everybody knows about them and doesn't do them. Well, this is a text that leans into them and says, stop fighting with each other. Go and eat the fat, meaning be a glutton. Drink the sweet wine and send portions of them to those who have nothing prepared for this is the day that is holy to our Lord. Do not be grieved for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So if you are someone who holds on to those seven deadly sins and those 10 commandments or whatever list of rules you think makes you be better in God's sight, Ezra is saying it is better to have a party and to blow your diet and your New Year's resolution than to argue about who God loves. Because it's not an argument because God does the loving. So, Nehemiah. Pastor Amanda, do you want to say anything about that? Boom. Okay. I deserved a mic drop. Okay. Oh, really? Yeah, it was good. And I'll say that the, the big thing back here behind me <laughs> is actually a, a sermon. So I used a big giant whiteboard for my sermon on John the Baptist. So you'll see this figure dude here uh, on there, and that's John the Baptist and calling for repent. What you can't see at the bottom of the, I'm trying to point to it, at the bottom of the screen down here is um, the kingdom side that talks about security and safety and gratitude and joy and forgiveness and all the good stuff. But that's down near the floor end because I was proud of my, my drawing of the figure guy. So I left him up where I could see him. Hmm. Yeah. The other fun thing that I want to point out is in verse eight, um, because if you have ever been around Christians who will say things like, it's not up for a debate. It, God's word is just, it is. It's so easy to understand that everyone understands it and you don't have to interpret it and it doesn't have meaning and it doesn't have context. And so the irrational thing I'm trying to convince you God wants, you can't argue with me because the Bible says so and I'm right. Um, verse 8 in our reading says they read from the book, from the law of God, with interpretation. They gave sense so that the people understood the reading. They are taking this reading and reading it within their place and their time and their context. And there has never been a time ever 
where that hasn't been the case. Um, and so as, as Lutheran pastors, we don't believe in every single word written in the Bible being literally perfectly true. We believe in something called historical critical reading. And the idea is that all of these stories take place within a context, within a location, within a time. And some of those um, stories can give us really good lessons about how to live within our community. And at the same time, we can say, Ugh, slavery, that's a horrible thing that shouldn't be in the Bible. And I don't care if so-and-so says slavery is okay. It's still wrong because it's not good for the community. And so we always are reading biblical texts with context. We've reread some of the understandings about divorce. We have reinterpreted some of the, the readings about women and how active they can be in the church. Um, or, as I was saying before, remember how I said sometimes tradition is just, let's just pick these pieces that I like and those are going to be the ones that everybody has to follow and we never did any other way. Um, mostly by white men. Um, like, there's a million texts in scripture about women serving at all levels of God's kingdom. There's a million texts about slaves being let free um, throughout the scripture. So we have great texts, we have problematic texts, but what we have in this reading from Nehemiah is a reminder that there is no text that is read without interpretation. So, there. Nothing. Amanda's got nothing. I guess All right. I, you covered it. it. You covered it well. I, like I said, I'm going to talk about Nehemiah and then Pastor Amanda's going to talk about Corinthians because I think it's boring because it's been so read over and over and over and over again. We're so diverse. Yeah, you're the arm and I'm the elbow and you're the cheekbone and I'm the nostril. Ooh, we're all different parts. <laughs> well, let's hear what Pastor Amanda has to say about it. Maybe you'll change my mind and I'll think it's amazing. I don't think I'll change your mind, but this was one of my ordination texts, <laughs> which means it's a text that is really <laughs> central to how I understand the church and how I understand being a part of God and God's world. And um, I think that I think I've used this at every installation that I've had as well, because I, for me, one of the most powerful pieces about being a person of faith is getting to be a part of a community that is making a difference. And I think that when I was younger, trying to find a way to own my own gifts without feeling like I was trying to be a, a diva about being good at something or uh, that I was showing off because I was good at something. This kind of a text gives permission for us to own the gifts that God has given us and use them without it being about trying to make ourselves bigger and better. And Yahoo, look at me. To be able to Facebook say, selfies. <laughs> Facebook selfies. Oh, Lord. To be able to say I'm a I'm a good singer, and it can sound like I'm trying to puff myself up. But if I I am a good singer and I use that to build up the body of Christ, I use that to bring um, joy and to um, bring hopefulness to God's people. Then it's not so much about making sure everybody knows how awesome I rock. It's really about being a part of this this body of Christ. And so that gave me a lot of freedom when I was younger and becoming a person of faith to start to understand that being grateful for gifts that you've been given isn't being selfish or grandiose or showing off. Um, and this text for folks who've been in the church for a long time is very familiar. Um, it's it's this everybody has something important to offer kind of a thing. For folks who aren't part of the church, this is a text that doesn't get quoted at people as often as some other texts do. So it's a little less familiar. Um, because if you're quoting texts at somebody, you typically don't choose the ones that are inclusive and celebrate diversity. So Although I've heard this text read to shame people into hosting more coffee hours because not enough people are helping. So like, <laughs> you know, like every every verse probably got some baggage in some sort of way. Every text has baggage somewhere along the line. I think what I particularly love about this text is this opportunity to understand that just the beautiful diversity. And 
that we don't that not everyone is good at the same things and that's actually really beautiful and what this text has done in my life has given me the ability to look and watch other people and see their gifts and skills and instead of either feeling intimidated because i don't have those gifts and skills um, or feeling competitive because I should try to be all things to all people um, or any of those things, I'm able to look at their gifts and skills and say, wow, that is so awesome. The body of Christ is so cool. And I'm so glad that I don't have to do X, Y, Z because I really stink at it. And that person is really awesome at it. I could never play the organ. I am not created to play the organ. And I am so grateful that God has created people to to play the organ. I'm not a morning person. The only time I have ever been a morning person in my lifetime is when I had a brain injury. Like seriously, it took a brain injury for me to be able to wake up easily in the morning. And that was part of how I knew I was recovering from my concussion was because all of a sudden I was having a hard time waking up in the morning again. So I am so grateful for that diversity in, in the body that allows there to be some people who function really, really well at 6 a.m. And for me to be able to function really, really well at 1 a.m. Because people need people to be supportive at all the hours people, of the day and night. People need people. <laughs> people who get up at 6 a.m. for Pastor Amanda. <laughs> So, are the luckiest people in the world. <laughs> I think um, I, I just this passage is a really beautiful opportunity to to find ways in your own life to appreciate who you are and to appreciate who other people are without it having to be a competition or a shame cycle or any of those kinds of things. Well, and it, it should be helpful to remember that when reading First and Second Corinthians reading reading into why they needed this letter written to them can give you a great understanding about how church has always worked and probably always will work um because this is a text that's that's written at a time when some women were being faithful and so they chose to be celibate and then as a result their husband would be the prostitutes and that was a problem for the christian church and some people were gossiping way too much and other people were um, eating all of the communion food before other people arrived because they wanted their fancy food and they didn't want to eat the food that the poor people would bring later when they got off work and so this text is beautiful poetry because it helps us to aspire into a kind of loving kindness and symmetry with the world where we understand like like i'm imagining um in the lion king where simba gets raised and every everything all comes together right and and then we feel like every, like the trees are breathing with us and and it's just amazing right when you feel like everything is all kind of in rhythm and so this is this is a text that reminds us of those mountaintop moments where we feel like the world is an amazing mystical wonderful place but um the messier truth of it is like any um body image issues that we have in our own life is how we live out this text, right? If you look in the mirror, if every day for your whole life you looked in the mirror and you're like, damn, I look great, then you should seek therapy because I don't know anything that anyone that that's actually true for. Everyone's always said at least, oh, my thighs, oh, my thing, oh, I got a gray hair, oh, a booger, right? There's always at least something. But if you actually look in the mirror every day and you say, damn, I look good, I'm happy about that. I think that's awesome. No, no. I mean, make it a goal. But if you've, because if you've already had your one day previously where you didn't like what it was, then every day for the rest of your life, you can do it. And it, there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> but I'm just saying, like, I love that the, the metaphor is a body because we have so many ways that we feel messed up about our bodies so like we might be like oh my th thighs are fat and then someone else who has bigger thighs is like screw you those aren't big thighs why do you even say that right or um a loved one might think we're prettier than we think we are or 20 years later we look at pictures of ourselves from high school and be like what the heck was i thinking i was so beautiful 
Um, so our perspective changes and the same is true. We might denigrate someone and say, oh, well, I'm definitely the left foot, but you're an elbow. What's an elbow do anyway, besides need lotion, right? Like, so we can, we, we have moments where we relegate other people's jobs to more or less important. I'm the eye. I'm amazing. Oh, I'm the hair on the big toe sad right like so we have the ability to be judgy about it um but i just i like that you know it's the same blood it's the same cells it's the same atoms that are kind of knitting us together and no one gets to claim i'm closer to god because we're all in with and through god um there's something really beautiful and and mystical about that idea that if god is everywhere we are in God and God is in us and she is he and we are he together, right? Like the beginning of, of the Gospel of John, this idea. And, um, there and that was actually one of the ways that Martin Luther was able to get out of um, being killed during the Reformation is this kind of mystical thinking because they would say, some some reformers would say, how can the bread and the wine truly be the body and blood of Christ if Christ is at the right hand of God? And Luther um, sat at this big table arguing with people and he wrote um, in chalk on the table, uh, this is my body. And then they just argued, this is my body for like an entire day. And, and Luther's argument was, if God is everywhere, if God is everywhere in creation, indistinguishable, like you can't say what's not God because God is just everywhere, then Jesus can be at the right hand of God and be in the bread on the table um, because God is at the table. And so Jesus can be just to the right in the bread, right? In, with, and through. And he left it in kind of a mystical space, which is which is kind of fun. If you're If you're not geeky and you don't like Reformation stuff, well then that's okay too. But it's fun to sometimes know that Martin Luther kind of got down with some mystical in between the lines understanding. Anyway, bodies, that's my thoughts about bodies. And I'm going to take a nap right over here. There's so much to talk about about bodies. And I think it's really interesting because my research this semester for my doctorate work is I think heading right down that line. So um, I will probably be talking more about bodies and embodiment and um, our faith and of course, inevitably roller derby. Um, in, and also in there's the a weird smell in my office and I don't know where it's coming from. I'm sorry. It's a I good thing that the I internet doesn't me. share that. Yeah. Uh, the internet doesn't share it. <laughs> You have been on a plane flight and you do need to go home and get some rest. So why don't we move on to Luke and what's Luke. happening? I like this Luke text. Do you want me to start talking? Go Try for it. Try to stop me. <laughs> um, so this Luke text is one of my favorite of all of the things that Jesus says and does. And if you thought, if you've ever had someone tell you, that's proof texting, you can't just take that one bit of scripture, you gotta take all the bits of scripture, and you read other verses and you're like, that's a stupid thing, I'm never gonna say the Moabites are that horrible. Um, then this is the reading for you. Um, so you have to remember back in the day, the Bible was not found like this. The Bible was a scroll and you had different scrolls. And Luke's gospel was so long that it had to be divided into two scrolls or you couldn't uh, open it up and read it. The first half of Luke is called Luke. The second half of Luke is called the Acts of the Apostles. Um, and you should also know that in, in Jerusalem, uh, people believed that Jesus was the rabbi of a synagogue, like a regular synagogue that he would be at each week. Um, and then he might travel to different places in between and, and do talks and lectures. And, um, but that in, in Capernaum, that there is a synagogue that is called uh, Jesus' synagogue. It is believed that he was the rabbi. And it is about 15 feet uh, from the Sea of Galilee. 
And so it might be that this is the place where it's read. So um, you can imagine a traditional Jewish synagogue if you've been into one before. Um, if you haven't, the, the main difference between a, a Christian worship space and a Jewish worship space is that the big area behind the, the altar has a little box. And if you, at, there's a point in the worship service where the doors get open and the Torah scroll gets pulled out and the rabbi reads it. And so it was, it was common at the time that you, you would read your bit and then you might scroll along and read another section and you kind of would be preaching and then you would read from different bits of the Torah by scrolling back and forth. So when Jesus unrolls the scroll, it, in the story, makes everyone's jaw drop and they freak out. And it's because they had a visual. It wasn't because they had the Torah memorized, but because they saw Jesus rolling back and forth. And so that if he skipped parts, you'd know it because you'd see him rolling to the next part. And so the text that Jesus reads is from, from the book of Isaiah, but it's not read word for word. Jesus skips bits. And the parts that he skips are the you're going to hell repent bits and about how horrible the Moabites are, right? Um, and he just reads the good part. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Um, many historians, when they date back to when uh, the time period when they think that Jesus was alive, argue that um, Jesus is reading this text on the year of the Jubilee, and that is a time when you, if you own slaves, you set them free. If you bought someone's land that had been in their family forever, you give the land back to that family. If you, if someone has a debt to you, the debt, the debt is erased. Um, some places observe that for a, a whole year. Some places observed it for seven years. It depends kind of on, on the culture and the custom. So it's possible that Jesus is just doing a typical Sunday morning sermon on the year that they are celebrating, and this is his way of talking about the Jubilee and extending the Jubilee from um, the ways that people have contracts with each other on earth to the way God has covenant with everyone and talking about God's love being a part of this Jubilee. So a, a Jubilee year of forgiveness without any mention of sin. And this is very, this is not the text that people are gonna say turn or burn are ever gonna read out loud to you because they want, or they their relationship with Jesus is one where Jesus does read the words about do these things or you're in big trouble. Um, the other thing that is interesting about this text. I'll just jump in for a second yeah. and say that one of the interesting things happening this year uh, that Pope Francis has oh, done. Oh, yeah, I was going to say that too. Go ahead. Is some, some of a form of a jubilee in the sense of uh, welcoming back those who have been divorced and I believe have had abortions, correct? Yeah, it's called the Year of Mercy. So we have this Year of Mercy happening in the Roman Catholic Church. It's not like jubilee regarding debts but it's a way to welcome some folks back it doesn't go to the kind of welcome that you experience in the lutheran church but it is a very interesting uh choice by pope francis yeah because for this year there's a special door at saint peter's basilica and if you walk through it you get indulgences something that the reformation was but over that being kind of sucky. Um, but you get kind of a get out of jail free card by walking through the special door on a special day. Um, but I mean, I think it's great that there's a year of forgiving what was thought to be unforgivable. unforgivable. The difficulty of being a Pope is that you are required if you change your mind on something. Like for example, once a Pope declares that you can't wear condoms because you don't want to interrupt God's cycle of creation, then when something like the AIDS crisis happens, you can't change your mind based on context. And it leads to some really horrible, awful things being said out loud. Um, and you can't 
trace those words back because you can't say another pope was wrong, but you have to find a new way to say how God is doing a new thing. And so a year of mercy or a year of jubilee gives the impression that we can be kinder to people who are divorced. Um, and, uh, and in the Catholic Church, if you confessed to having an abortion in your life, you were never allowed to take communion for the rest of your life because it was considered the worst sin um, in the entire Catholic Church. Um, their reasoning behind that is because it not only violates the commandment not to kill, but in, in their belief, it kills someone who's incapable of defending themselves. And so it's the lowest form that you could ever possibly do. Um, there's obviously some political reasons why that has maintained a lot of importance in that in that church space. What's hard for me as a Lutheran is I think it's fantastic to have a year of mercy, but why would you only have a year of mercy? Why couldn't you have a lifetime of mercy or yeah, yeah. receive, you know, communion at any time because Jesus gave it to you um, and not the rules of the church? And that's just one of the differences between being a Lutheran and not being a Lutheran. Yep. That, that kind of ability to welcome all people, no matter what they've done, and say that God loves you and names you and claims you, not in spite of all the crap you've done in your life, um, but holistically that God names you and claims you, maybe even knowing you're going to be up to all that stuff. It's hard to, we don't know, but we think that it's not our place to figure it out. It's just our place to accept the gift that God has already given us. Luther, um, the way Martin Luther would would talk about it is he would say, it's not possible for us to declare that there is a sin that Jesus can't forgive, because if we would, we would be calling Jesus a liar. When Jesus says, I came to forgive you of all of your sins, if we say, except for, or unless you, if we add anything to the end of Jesus as I came to save you from your sins, Martin Luther believed that we called Jesus a liar because Jesus declared that our sins are forgiven, then our sins are forgiven, and there's nothing we can do to change that because God is God and we're not. And so um, it's just different ways of thinking about how the world works. Um, and if you're interested in where some of that idea comes from, I, I think some of it centers from this space in, in Luke's gospel where Jesus is being a radical, being a pretty big radical. And I, one thing that um, going back, stepping backward for just a moment um, regarding abortion and that kind of piece, last semester I found out some really fascinating pieces about um, the role of that in the early church, in the first 300 years of the church, and um, some really fascinating information about kind of the origins of that and how it actually helped to beget the growth of the Christian church in the early centuries and part of the reason why women would convert to Christianity, um, keeping in mind that women were possessions and husbands could demand that they have abortions mm. and infanticide and abortion were very common um, if the owner decided, the husband would decide that either a female child was not desired or this next child coming was not desired, they could just either have the child exposed. Um, so infanticide by exposure was commonly accepted and normal. And um, or they could just order an abortion. And so mortality rates of women were incredibly high, as well as mortality rates of female infants were incredibly high. And so the Christian church, the early Christian church didn't allow abortion and didn't allow infanticide. And so it created a large conversion rate of women because they would live longer and their female children would live and then they brought their families with them. And so it was a way of, um, women having agency over their own bodies, that that this was something that was given to them through being a part of the Christian faith. 
it is fascinating to me and is going to be a source of more research for me, I think this semester or sometime in the next year or two, to say, to look at how that has shifted and changed in our modern culture, that it went from being something that gave agency to women over their bodies and now is being used to um, remove agency over their own bodies from women um, in the removal of um, choice when it comes to abortion and making it illegal. And so um, it, religion is a, an interesting thing and that 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 process is a very fascinating um, it's a very fascinating process. These things that were created within the Roman culture, were very specifically in regard to and, and in relation to what was happening within the Roman culture. So if you're interested in learning more about that, um, keep an eye on my writing and blogs and things like that, um, because I'll probably be writing more about that in the months to come as I continue this research. Yeah, and, and I'll put a link down here if you're on uh, justlutheran.blogspot.com to the ELCA social statement on abortion. Um, and the new uh, social message on gender violence, because those can be very interesting things to read. But if the only takeaway that you have is that life is complicated and God's going to love you no matter how complicated and yucky and mucky it gets, um, then that I think is the point. Um, I think God's love is always going to be more diverse than the imaginations of people who are struggling to live with diversity in their world. Um, so the more we can figure out how to be diverse, the better we'll be. Amen. So thanks for joining us, folks. It yeah. was nice to have you with us, and uh, we'll see you again next week. Okay, love you. Bye.